my fellow Dream Chasers and Disney fans across the world. Welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? And yes, as you can tell, I have the thumbnail for my series uh, in the background because I have a green screen behind me. Uh, it's, it's propped up on my desk chair, essentially. And the green screen is actually being kept in place, I kid you not, by my jacket. <laughs> Method to my wow. madness. Method to my madness, folks. But nevertheless, today we are talking about Peter Pan, released in 1953. Drew a bit of controversy with uh, how the um, uh, Native Americans were portrayed, but we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that uh, as we go through the film. But of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on board. Now, I've been, tr I've been trying for months to try and get her on here. Uh, I was meant to have her on board with uh, Cinderella, but she, uh, but she had family commitments to take care of. We were, meant to do, we were meant to do this a couple of weeks ago, but again, family commitments and everything uh, going on in the world right now. Um, her parents just celebrated uh, their anniversary uh, yesterday, so uh, happy belated anniversary uh, to them. But nevertheless, she's finally here. It's Bethany Campbell. Beth, finally, welcome along. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I know it's been a long time coming. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so, so, initial thoughts. Initial thoughts on Peter Pan before we get uh, before we get started. What are your initial thoughts on it? I really liked the film. Just as like, just it's a good one to watch. It's a classic one. Even to this day, it's it's really actually. Like it still looks great considering how old it is. Yeah. Um, and it's always a classic so I enjoyed it. I liked how getting to review it again because it's been a while since I've watched it. Yeah. And 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 that's the that's the great that's the great thing about me actually creating this series uh, uh, to begin with. Now for now, um just a little bit just a little bit of background, folks. For those that don't know how this um for, for don't know how this series actually came about. Uh, March 23rd last year, Disney Plus launched in the UK. And I figured since we, since we were in lockdown from the previous day, I figured why not, why not do something like this? And let's just say the amount of people I've actually got on board to be guests uh, previously and in upcoming episodes, it, it, it just wouldn't be possible without being able to get uh, those um, people on board and Beth, don't worry, I've got your man on board for uh, Sword in the Stone. I've got, I've got him on board for that. So, uh, so say Sword in the Stone. I'll get to that in the next um, uh, few weeks. I'm actually recording another episode tomorrow with uh, somebody that's been on uh, somebody that's been on there, uh, been on this show on a number of occasions, covering Bambi, Dumbo, and our Christmas special, The Nightmare Before Christmas. All of which you can find in the Kingdom of Isolation playlist in the top right of your screens. So uh, we've got our notes ready. I've got the scores for the film. So I'll, um, I'll get all that. Um, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the scores in at the end and, um, and then we'll see where it ranks among the other films that I've um, uh, talked about on this series so far. And for the one year anniversary of uh, Disney Plus and Kingdom of Isolation, folks. That that one year anniversary week, folks. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be putting I'm gonna be like putting together a top ten of the films that have been reviewed so far, and I am going in. I am going based on the scores that they have received. So, if your favorite film isn't in that top ten, blame the scores. But of course, just to be on the safe side. Spoiler alert in place if you haven't seen this film yet, as it, it's on Disney Plus, as with all the classics apart from Make Mine Music, but hopefully we get that fixed later down the road. Uh, but nevertheless, let's take a trip to Neverland as we talk about Peter Pan. So a staple of a staple of um, the Disney films at the time, opening credits with their uh, choral music and the song and the song in question here. Uh, on this occasion is second star to the right, which ties into a quote uh, that Peter brings up um, later on in the film. Now, one of the things I one of the things I liked about um, the opening credits is the fact that the film was dedicated to Great Ormond Street Hospital, which um, which is very which is very close to the to, to the um, 
the author of the source material, uh, J.M. Barry. And interestingly as well, a uh, couple of things here. You've got, uh, this was the last film to be distributed by RKO Radio Pictures as far as their Disney films uh, were concerned. Um, and also the copyright for this film, interestingly, was issued in 1952, but it was released in 1953, interestingly. Not sure how that, not sure how that came about, but um, what else can you do? Uh, it, this does have similar, this does have similar opening credits to Alice in Wonderland, where you, where you, you see like the different areas of uh, Wonderland that we'll be exploring throughout the film. So then, yeah, in sorry. Fraser, interestingly enough, I learned obviously Great Ormond Street and actually the hotel that I work for also raised money. That's the charity that they raise money for. So again, you learn something new every day. But that, that is so that's something that I actively raise money for. That is that is absolutely fantastic. Hats off to you and the and the hotel team for that says, say, hey, how's, how's about that, folks? So, so like, like Beth just said, learn something new every day. Every day is a school day in the Kingdom of Isolation. So now, so now we actually get into the, um, the start of the film. Let's say we're in London, England, around about 1900 era. And you've got, and we're introduced to the Darling family, George, Mary, Wendy, John, and Michael. And once I get the cast up, um, uh, Catherine Beaumont uh, plays uh, Wendy. Uh, she was actually, I think she's been uh, part of a uh, previous Disney project. She was also the voice of Alice in Alice in Wonderland. You've got Paul Collins, who voices uh, John. Heather Angel voices Mary. And if I can find where the um, Wendy and uh, John and Michael, whereabouts are they? Was it their, their voice actors have to be here somewhere. Oh boy. Um, uh, well, let's say I can't pinpoint the can't pinpoint the voice actors. Oh, actually, um, actually, there we go. Uh, we've got uh, Tommy Lusk, uh, L U S K E, who voices uh, Michael, and you see. Uh, if I can find it, there's got to be the voice actor for John somewhere, but, um, oh, right, uh, Paul, Paul, oh, right, hi, oh, I've, 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 I've read, I've read my notes wrong, <laughs> oh, dearie me, Sylvie, uh, Catherine does Wendy, Paul does John, one of the old, the older of the two darling boys, and um, Hans Conried is the guy that voices, um, George, but he, he also voices somebody else later down the road, which ties in somewhat to uh, a fan theory. I mean, I mean, you, I mean, you know, and you know, you know how dedicated this, you know, you've got a dedicated Disney fan when they concoct all these bizarre fan theories. And some of them do actually make sense if you, if you think about them long enough. But um, yeah, we're introduced to them and you've got, you've got a St. Bernard named Nana, and there's a, there's a running gag, there's a running gag throughout that scene with the uh, the wooden blocks, where the the, the, the try, Nan is trying to get the, um, uh, the the wooden blocks all set up, and, and at the top you got A B C, uh, and the running gag is they keep getting knocked down, and then she, and then Nan is just like, oh, great, I have to rebuild all over again, which begs the question. I know I know it's I know it's animation, and I know they do need to cut corners, but would would the building blocks be built up as quickly as they have as, as they are? Well, Probably I mean, not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I didn't work on the film. I mean, heck, we. I mean, neither of us were around in 1953. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be here until another 40 years later. <laughs> yeah, but um, but it's it's during it's during a game that John and Michael are playing where they actually use um, uh, George's whatever it is he puts over his shirt or under it whatever. Um, 
they use that as the uh, treasure map. And the treasure map uh, leads to the treasure, which turns out to be George's cufflinks for his shirt. I mean, how did the kids manage to get hold of the cufflinks to begin with? The pesky kids, aren't they? They'll get into anything. Yeah. And then, and then, it, and then it all escalates to the point where, because uh, every night Wendy is telling John and Michael the stories of uh, Peter Pan and Captain Hook, and it, it, it escalates to the point where uh, not only Nana is forced to be outside, effectively um, tied up to a, a kennel, but also George tells Wendy that it's going to be her last night in the nursery. And you got to think to yourself, that's a bit, you got to think, that's, that's, a, that's a bit extreme as far as parenting is concerned. Because when, if Wendy leaves the nursery, who's going to tell John and Michael those stories about Peter Pan? So then we, um, so then once John, uh, not, not John, George, George and, uh, hang on, bear with me. Uh, Mary, that's the one. Uh, Mary voiced by Heather Angel. Uh, George and Mary head to their uh, night out event. Um, that's when we that's when we see that's when we see Peter for the first time. But I will I will say this though. Uh the lighting on Peter's face when when we see him uh for the first time in the film, and you've got to think about beside him, the lighting on his face at that particular point, to me that's a little bit disturbing, the way the lighting is on his face. Now could that lead, could that lead, could that be hinting towards anything in particular? Anyway, um, so then once we see, so then once, so, right. <laughs> This, this is the challenge for doing these sort of things, folks. Um, is that when I've only got notes to work with and I don't necessarily have like a, a script to work from. Uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's a good thing not to work from a script because I don't, want, I don't want it to be, I don't want these episodes, I don't want the series to be like too manufactured, if that makes sense. So, so that's why I've got my notes in front of me. So I've got my notes as sort of like a base to work from. Um, but of course, um, but of course, uh, one of the main reasons Peter's there is not just listening to Wendy's stories, but also at the same time, uh, he doesn't have his shadow with him. Because uh, lo and behold, the shadow's been hiding in the nursery the whole time. And, oh boy. Um, even in the 50s, we weren't, we were not safe from, uh, some we weren't safe from uh, seeing innuendos in um, kids' films. I mean, this sort of stuff definitely wouldn't. This sort of stuff definitely definitely wouldn't. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? It definitely wouldn't. It definitely wouldn't go over well with families, fans. Uh, families, fans of the film, depending on what film it is, uh, and especially, especially the um, the critics and those making the film to begin with. They say these sort of things wouldn't fly today. One of them being the uh, the um, the underwear shots that we see of uh, Tinkerbell when she gets stuck in one of the drawers. Um, but of course. Why would she be, why would she have an issue with her appearance? And I had, this is how I had, this is legitimately how I've worded it in my notes. 
in regards to the underwear shots, is that why would Tinkerbell have an issue with her appearance? Looking at her reflection in like, some sort of mirror, and and then when it and then when it comes to the underwear shots later, it's a case of oh, that's why. But oh. yeah, that's all I said. I said that's what that's one of the that's one of the uh, few things in this film that definitely wouldn't um, go over well in this day and age, especially with how yeah. especially with how somewhat somewhat overly sensitive, if you will, the internet can be sometimes. Well, you just think about the um, impact that media has, especially on female body images. So. Yeah. It's just all built up, isn't it? Especially in the fifties, it is something yeah. that obviously yeah. <laughs> it stems from, and you still have today. And I think that's hopefully what people in media are starting to recognise the impact that they can have. But yeah, I say, I say, I say the whole, I say the whole body image thing. Definitely something that's um, we need. We need to be a, a bit more sensitive towards uh if you will i mean i mean, I mean especially especially with uh, especially with the news towards the end of last year that because of because of all the uh the hateful comments that that jesse nelson got she uh, it got to the point where she had to leave little mix because of all the uh, the hate she was getting and it was and it was taking a massive toll on her mental health and if i mean if either of us were uh, if either of us were in her position I wouldn't blame. I wouldn't blame her for the. I wouldn't blame her for what. She, I wouldn't blame her for um, walking for leaving Little Mix. But the four of them still support each other because they're still like they're like sisters, if you will. Because I mean, they 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 were they were put together as a group on 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 the X Factor way back in like twenty eleven, roughly twenty eleven. It would have been, and lo and behold. Here they are, 10 years later, one of the biggest girl groups in the world. Similar success, believe it or not, to the Spice Girls. Wow, didn't know that. Yeah, and, but, uh, but, uh, but a, lot, a lot of Jessie's fans especially are definitely excited uh, after the news that she dropped earlier this week where uh, there's, pos there's not, it, nothing's been confirmed at the moment. But there is rumors circling circulating that she that Jesse is starting to work on some solo material. So we could end oh. up with we could end up with a solo album later down the road. Does that make you question her reason for leaving Little Mix? Well, well, I think well it, it's it, it, it's tough to it's tough to it's tough to like pinpoint whether it was the right decision to to leave uh, the group to begin with, but um, but, at the, but at the end of the day, she felt she did what she did what she felt was right for her at the end of the day, and 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 us as fans should just we should just leave it at that. Yeah. No, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And then we've got, and then once, um, and then once uh, Peter finds his shadow, uh, it ends up waking Wendy, John, and Michael. It ends up waking the kids up. And oh boy, uh, the way the way Wendy is just rambling on. Could she ramble on any more than she already has? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, I, I I won't I won't repeat what Peter said at that specific point. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be able to repeat what what he said anyway because uh, I, I don't actually remember the line off offhand. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> probably for the best. Uh, probably for the best. If that's probably for the best. But uh, but yeah, um, but yeah. Um, but then, uh, but, back, but back to Tinkerbell being stuck inside uh, inside the drawer. Um, the way she turns, the way she turns red, and then just that 
unsettling music in the background, you just got to think to yourself, this is not going to end well. And, oh dear. I say, I say, I say the way Wendy was just rambling on, um, and, and I actually, and I say, and, uh, with, with the line that Peter said at that point, again, again, this is legitimately how I've put it in, in my notes. It, it's a case that, and Peter just backed <laughs> up my point. That, I was like, I, was like I, I do love bringing up how I, how I, how I do legitimately type some of my notes. But, uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, once all the, but once all that's out of the way, Wendy and, uh, Wendy, John and Michael, um, faith, trust, and a little bit of pixie dust, which is also, um, which is also hint, uh, there's also hints, there's, there's also hints to uh, the song, You Can Fly, um, Thanks to the thanks to the lyrics that Peter uh, brings up, and then the kids join in as well. But um, but, be but before but before all that, um, Wendy tries to kiss Peter. Tinkerbell manages to get herself out of the drawer with with the use of uh, a pair of scissors. Beggars believe how she managed that. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, I I think there's a little bit of jealousy from Tinkerbell towards Wendy. What makes you think that, Fraser? Because <laughs> um, because um, well, the jealousy is more towards uh, Tink Tinkerbell thinks that Wendy is interested in getting together with Peter. And yeah, I think she doesn't like sharing Peter's attention with oh. another female. Which is, which, which, which further ties into the whole uh, jealousy thing, the jealousy thing. And uh, it, it sort of hits, um, it sort of hits uncomfortable levels later on. But we'll get, we'll, we'll cover that. We'll cover that shortly. Um, but of course, when... But of course, um, they have they have the uh, they're all they're showered with pixie dust, and then they can fly, and and Peter says off to Never Neverland, off to Never. Oh boy, that that somewhat didn't come out correctly. Not not hey hey mine's out of the gutter, folks. Not in that sense. Off to Neverland, but the way I worded it, off to Never Neverland. Insert Metallica reference here because they've because they've got um because of their because of their song Enter Sandman and the the last line at the end of the chorus is we're off to Never Neverland. Now I, I mean I mean I I could play that clip, but uh, yeah, copyright issues. Probably best to probably best to keep that away from here for now. Because, because, uh, because you, you know how protective some people can be with their, uh, with their copyright stuff, especially when it comes to companies like Disney. Mm. Yeah, but um, what's well, amazing about when they're flying through Neverland is just the the animation of London, and yeah. I know that some of the critics would say about how because it's so amazing, like London and all those imagery, then when you compare it to Neverland and it's hard to get as amazing as that. Um, yeah. So some, some critics say that it's the, um, it kind of overpowers or shows up Neverland because the um, animation is just so amazing in London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so which, which, which then ties into when, uh, towards the end of uh, the song, You Can Fly, they, uh, they they end up on they end up on Big Ben, and 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 pro probably the mo probably the most iconic quote of the whole film. Second star to the right and straight on till morning. 
but this I'm not sure whether to call this somewhat of a plot hole or not, but it does it does feel like that that the plot hole here is a case of yes, I can start to write straight on till morning, but yet in terms of being in London, the film takes place effectively over that one night, as far as as far as London is concerned. But um, but I'm, saying, I'm I'm not sure how the timing works on I'm not sure how the the um, uh, the day length on Neverland works compared to London. I I I don't know. I'm not I'm not the one that wrote this. I'm not the one that wrote the book. So that might that might need a bit more research as far as how long the days are in Neverland. <laughs> yeah, but um, then but then we then when we actually get. Then when we actually see Neverland for the first time, you actually see the whole Neverland island. And then, oh boy, one of the most notorious villains in all of Disney history. This is where we are introduced to Captain Hook, who's al who is also voiced by Hans Conried. Now, there's an interesting, th the theory that I briefly mentioned earlier, folks. The, the theory is that George is actually Captain Hook in Wendy's stories to John and Michael. Now, I'm not, now I'm not sure. Was it? Now, uh, I, said, now I, I don't know how specifically that all works. I haven't really read too much into that fan theory, but with the way with the way George acts towards Wendy saying that it's her last night in the nursery, and then when you see how Captain Hook acts towards his crew, there are some similarities there if you think about it. Very harsh way, isn't it? It's a very authoritative. Yeah. They're the, they're the leader. They get to. Yeah. They, they watch it, what. Let's see, let's see, but, but you, you can see, you can see my point regarding you can see my point regarding the fan theory that George is effectively Captain Hook in Wendy's stories. And and then the next song, so, albeit a little brief. Um, well, the, the next couple of songs. Uh, one one of them uh, on the uh, on the crow's nest with his accordion. A life of a pirate is short. Yeah, not so subtle foreshadowing towards his um, demise at the hands of Captain Hook, who just shoots him out of the crow's nest, and he just, and he just. Now let me see. Where was I? He just. How does he keep such a cool head when doing something like that? But when having a go at Mister Smee, he just completely loses it. I mean, I mean, could could you be more polar opposite with that? I mean, cool headed when he takes out one of his crew and just continues on with his job as if nothing even happened. But when dealing with Mr. Smee, he completely loses it. How yeah, it's to show his character, isn't it? It's, it's to further show that he's, I guess, not caring that he, he just cares about himself, I guess, and that he, you know, he's okay to take out one of his crew because he doesn't really care about them, you know? Yeah. And, and this is, and this is, and this is all because, uh, for, for those, and this is all down to the fact that uh, Hook is somewhat obsessed with trying to um, eliminate Peter Pan, essentially. But um, uh, but uh, one one bit of uh, one little flaw with the sound design while we're on the subject of this particular scene is that you actually see you see in the animation that you actually see him clicking his gun, but yet there's no sound design to actually you don't, you don't, there, there isn't actually a gun click sound effect in there so. I say to me, to me, that's a small flaw in the sound design. And 
it's 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 just it's just one of the uh, just one of the many ways of showing how irredeemable Captain Hook is, in my eyes, anyway. But hey, but hey, who, but hey, who knows? I, I'm pro. I say, who knows? There's probably other people out there that are more, more or less, no pun intended, folks, more or less on the same boat as me in regards to uh, Hook being one of those irredeemable characters, akin, I say, another irredeemable uh, character in in Disney's um, uh, Disney's canon is, of course, Lady Tremaine from Cinderella. I mean, need I say more beyond that? But. Um, Um, when Smee is getting Hook ready for his shave, even though the only facial hair we see on Hook is his abnormally large mustache, uh, you you hear you hear the tick tock sound of a clock, and although an old an interesting little factoid regarding. The song in question here, Never Smile at a Crocodile. I see you, you do have the instrumental backing track when we're introduced to the crocodile for the first time, folks. Um, the way he's introduced is very clever because all you hear is the ticking of the clock that somehow, um, that somehow the uh, crocodile swallowed. I'll see if I can find it in my notes. In the da -da 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 -da. Very charged sphere of this crocodile. Whereabouts are we? Um, it's interesting because we can kind of feel like Captain Hook's anxiety, isn't it? Of like, oh, it's yeah. coming. Like a clock is a very good way to, I guess, like the ticking of the clock and it getting louder and quieter. And it just is a yeah. good way to, to show the fear that it brings. Yeah. All right. That's how. Right, that's how that. Right. So yeah, I've got that. Right. I've got the notes there. Right. That's that's how that's how that worked. Um. As, as far as how the crocodile swallowed the clock, which which we then find out later is an alarm clock. Um. The clock that the crocodile swallowed was the clock that Hook dropped after his hand got chomped off and essentially. Uh, his hand got chomped off and essentially fed to the crocodile, thanks to Peter. Um, so yeah, uh, after the um, say, uh, say in the Disney film, oh my word, I've never actually, I've never actually realised this. In the Disney, the, the crocodile's name is the crocodile's name. I kid you not, folks. The crocodile's name is actually TikTok because of his TikTok sound of the clock he swallowed. He also tried to eat Hook every time he appeared. But Hook then drops his clock in the water below. And the crocodile ate it as well. And this and, and this all and this and that's all before the events of the film. But, but still, wow, how's about that? The crocodile's name is TikTok. <laughs> wow. But, How's it spelled? Like uh, the new app? TikTok, oh, no, 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 no. no it, it, the TikTok, the, tic, the, way the, tic, the way TikTok is spelled, it does have the C's in it. It does have the C's in it. Don't worry. It does have the C's in it. But, um, but, um, but, but, yeah, but yes, folks, uh, while she's mentioned, while she's, um, what, now that Beth mentioned uh, the TikTok app, yes, I do use TikTok as well. Which uh, link to that, you, link to my TikTok profile, you can actually find in the uh, in the description of uh, the video. Um, so yeah, uh, back to back to business. I say, good job I've got good job I've got hydration on hand because uh, doing these it does leave the throat leaving it does leave the throat feeling relatively dry. And because uh, so I said it's a good job both of us came prepared for for that. Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. Whereabouts are we? Whereabouts are we? Yeah. Um, Hook then gets the crew to ready their ready their cannons after managing to spot Peter flying towards them with Wendy, John, and Michael 
behind them. They, they're on a cloud, and then, and then once, the can, once the cannon starts firing, it's, uh, Peter's like, um, uh, 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 when you with the cannon, Peter sends the darlings off to safety while he baits the pirates. I mean, I mean, he's a little. Peter's a little bit cocky with, uh, with the pirate, with them, um, with Hook, and you can actually, you can actually see that cockiness coming through, being a bit of a showboat, like you think every shot missing and just going straight through the clouds. I mean, but yeah, that's one of the the things that critics would say about Han as well is that he is a bit cocky, and mm -hmm. normally in Disney characters, like when there's a character like Han and who's cocky, then they'll somehow have a downfall, which will humble them. But Peter doesn't really have that. Yeah, he he, he doesn't he doesn't have he doesn't have that he doesn't have that. Um, essence of humility about himself, yeah. but um, but after, let's say, but um, but then, but then Tinkerbell just storms off ahead of uh, Wendy to to get the lost boy to somewhat persuade the lost boys to uh there's let's just put it but let's just put it bluntly Tinkerbell wants to shoot Wendy out of the out of the sky and the um and that's where the lost boys that's where the lost boys come into play um yeah the uh but of course I mean I mean the way the way we're introduced to the Lost Boys on screen, uh, Tinkerbell trying to wake them up. Um, I mean, you've got you've got you've got a club on a stand, and it, and it's just conveniently, I think the convenience of that club. Um, Tinkerbell manages to push the club over. It knocks one of the Lost Lost Boys on on his head, and somehow by some miraculous convenience it lands in the arms of the lost boy who owns that club I was like, I was like I'm, I'm, I'm just calling that a I'm just calling that a stroke of uh, I'm just calling that a stroke of convenience but um, but, of co but of course oh smeg hang on a second what the heck happened there Oh boy, that's I didn't even pick up on that. Um, I don't know if that was on my side or, or what. Um well, yeah, yeah, not not sure not sure what happened, not sure what happened there, but um right, uh right, anyway, where was I? Where was I? Um uh, Lost Boys Club. Yeah, that yeah, that's where I was. Um, and then and then the Lost Boys will just just get into a fight amongst themselves, and then Tinkerbell finally manages to get their attention to persuade to persuade them to get their weapons and uh, take Wendy out of the sky. Um, which which then ties which ties into uh, which ties into what we um what what we um what I was questioning. When watching this film, uh, what does Tinkerbell have against Wendy? Which, which again ties into the whole jealousy thing that we uh, touched on at the start. But um, the fact that she somehow convinces the Lost Boys to effectively try and kill Wendy, to put it bluntly, and claim that it was Peter that ordered them to do so. At that point, she just went full-blown sociopath. 
He did, did, did. Yeah. But um but yeah, uh they do they do manage to they do manage to take Wendy out of the sky, but then lo and behold, Peter Peter storms in, saves the day, and oh boy. Um Tink tries to play Tink tries to play all innocent, but um the Lost Boys told Peter that Tink When trying to explain these sort of things, it's it gets confusing. I say he he said he said that she said that they said <laughs> that I said that you said. I say it, it, it's that whole it's that whole thing. But I yeah. say uh, the Lost Boys tell Peter that Tinkerbell said that Peter said that the Lost Boys were to shoot Wendy out of the sky. But then, but then. Um, but then Peter ends up banishing Tinkerbell because of uh, because of her actions. Now, is that a bit is that a bit of an overreaction, or would you say that was justified? Well, it depends. Like, obviously, there was a lot of you know where she was not wanting to use her theory does to help them fly, you know, so it was a few things that had happened that had shown it, but it was obviously very extreme yeah. to do that, but it kind of shows that their immaturities, isn't it, that yeah. Peter Pan has, but he's still a boy, and that he would mm-hmm. react like that. Yeah, so, um, so, once, so once Tinkerbell's been banished, um, John and Michael join the Lost Boys for probably what probably one of the best probably the best song of the whole film, following the leader. Uh, when they're when they're off to when they're off to find their uh, and I quote lyrics from the song, the engines. Yeah. Those sort of terms definitely not acceptable in this day and age. Well, I, what I found was interesting is that even at the start of the movie, like, mm-hmm. but obviously Disney have added, it said that these sort of stereotypes were not okay then and they're not okay now. So it uh, was they uh, weren't uh, just condoning it, condemning it, um, like compared to this day and age, but also said that it wasn't okay for them to add that in yet either. Yeah. And that, that's saying that's a, that's a, it's, a, it's 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 one of a it's one of a handful of um, uh, Disney films from that era that actually have that um, disclaimer at the start um, before before the film actually starts on uh, Disney Plus, folks. Um, but yeah, um, after the um, but then the plan of the plan of finding the Native Americans. So I'm, I'm just going to use Native Americans just to, so that we're on like some sort of safe ground. If that makes sense. Um, trying to find the Native Americans. John goes through like trying to go through a, a strategy. The element of element of surprise. This, that, and the other. And then lo and behold, Michael is trying to. Michael is trying to alert John that. The Native Americans are actually approaching, being disguised as trees, <laughs> and and then once and then once they um and then once they and then once they get captured, this is uh they they in my notes I've put you got captured by the Indians and it's all your fault, John, for not listening to Michael. You should listen, shouldn't you? Yep. I say, I say, I say. I mean, to me, that to me, that's just a perfect example of. Um, yes, the kid. Yes, you've got. Yes, you may have younger siblings in your family, but uh, they're not as dumb as you think. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, mines are. Just yeah, but um. 
That's, 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 that's just one of those examples of, uh, yes, the, yes, the sibling may be, yes, you've got, yes, you may have a sibling that's younger than you, but uh, they're not, they're, um, they're a lot smarter than you give them credit for. That's, 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 it's just one of those examples. Um, and then we get, and then we see the chief of the Native American tribe. And this is the start of where the whole controversy of this film comes into play, the way they were portrayed, the terms that were used, and especially the song, What Made the Red Man Red. Yeah, that song is definitely not going to be in the live action remake. <laughs> but I will be very intrigued to see how they go about portraying the Native Americans in this remake. I'll be very interested, very intrigued to see how they uh, how they pull that off. But um, we'll have to wait and see when that film does release. Is there a time where they say that they are planning on doing it? Uh, da, 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 boy, boy. Wait, let's see. Sequels, live action adaptation. This is what we're after. Um, uh, it doesn't look like we've got a release date for it yet, but um, what we do know is that the film is going to be debuting on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. I'll say, say no, no release date as of yet, but um, I'm, I'm sure we'll find out in due course because they've more, they've more or less got the cast sorted out for the remake because I mean because I mean, I mean if they're, if because I mean at the end of the day if they're not making let's say we have got we have got an anime we have got a new animated Disney film coming out uh Raya and the Last Dragon which is going to be premiering on Disney Plus in two weeks no less uh albeit on them um, premiere access but it'll be free it'll be free for everyone um round about June time, roughly, but I mean, but um, I mean, I, I mean, I might, I might do a review on the film, but uh, we'll uh, we'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what happens. Um, but back to the, back to the original. Um, Peter takes Wendy to see the mermaids at um, Mermaid Lagoon, and. This is another. This is another case for me of do the um, do the female characters especially have something against Wendy? Just why do they? Why do they someone? Why do they somewhat hate Wendy? Who because 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 they jokingly say that they are trying. They were only trying to drown Wendy. I mean, I'm like really. Hmm. But, but once that's out of the way, what I do like here at this point one is when Hook comes back on screen with Tiger Lily, the lighting of that scene changes. The lighting gets a lot, gets a bit darker, not just because we're approaching the end of the day in Neverland terms anyway, but we're all, but there's also that sense of danger as well with Hook on screen. And lo and behold, you've got Mr. Crocodile right behind them every step of the way. Well, TikTok, metaphor that's his name. Don't call him Mr. Crocodile when you know his name. Yeah, yeah, tick well, okay, we'll go with TikTok. <laughs> we'll go with TikTok from here on out. <laughs> I like, uh, no, got... I'm just joking. You can <laughs> think most people will recognize him as. Mr. Yeah, crocodile. yeah. So, so, so the crocodile right behind him every every step of the way, metaphorically, of course, because they're like in the water. You can't exactly step on water unless you're um, unless you're Jesus. But uh, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, I'll say I'll say more I'll say more more cockiness from Peter here, where he's playing mind game mind games with Hook and Smee. Uh, Managing to somehow perfectly imitate Hook's voice 
to take to tell Smee to take Tiger Lily back to her people. And then you've got the actual hook saying, I didn't order this, put her back on the rock. Because uh, cause come high tide, they're, they're going to try and drown her. Pleasant. <laughs> very, very pleasant. And, uh, and, more, and more games between uh, Hook and Peter with, um, with the uh, sort of like mini duel that they have. Uh, a, a, little, a little teaser, if you will, for the final showdown that they have towards the end of the film. Um, somehow, cartoon logic, both characters midair, and one of them ends up falling in, into the water or onto the ground. I say classic cartoon logic. Hmm. Uh, but, um, but, but of course, I say, I say, to, I say, that, I say that's just another example of the cockiness of Peter coming into play. Um, but then, but then after, after Peter, or so, uh, no, after Hook and Smee escape, bearing in, bearing in mind the tide's still rising at this point, um, they managed to escape the crocodile, but the crocodile's still following them. And uh, the crocodile is uh, right outside of the ship in the next scene. Meanwhile, Peter does manage to save Tiger Lily. And the, they, along with Wendy, head to uh, the, uh, the camp where the Native Americans are. And, oh boy. Um, yeah. The... <sighs> It's it's prob it's probably one of the probably for me one of the funniest scenes in the film where if um, uh, the trying to heat the trying to um, trying to keep trying to get Hook's body temperature up to a reasonable level, but um, somehow. Smee, being as bumbling as he is, manages to somewhat knock Hook out. Um, and somehow ends up putting a bit too much um, hot water into the basin his feet are in. And also the clever animation at this point of the, of the thermometer almost reaching breaking point, and then as soon as it pops, that gets Hook's attention, and and again he just loses it with Smee. But of course, it's just the, just the it's the beautiful irony of the "do not disturb" sign at that point in the film. It's just the irony of the "do not disturb" sign, and yet Smee elects to disturb Hook anyway, even though he's trying to recover from his latest encounter with the crocodile. Oh boy! As I've, as I've, I've, all, I've already covered the uh, I've already covered the whole um, controversy regarding what made the red man red. Uh, I mean, uh, something that something that definitely wouldn't work uh, in the remake, especially. Um, Michael has somewhat of a tattoo on him. Underage tattoos. Um, uh, definitely wouldn't definitely wouldn't work in my eyes. But um, but uh, but an another beautiful scene once once all that's out of the way is uh, when you've got Wendy singing to the, singing to John, Michael, and the Lost Boys at uh, the song "Your Mother and Mine," and I just put after that. Beautiful. I mean, not much else I can say. Not much else I can say on that on that scene beyond that. But then it's amazing uh, to see. I think that the you know, like the way that they portrayed women. But that's one thing that is really good. How important that their mothers are as well. Yeah. 
and how irreplaceable they are. That's a, a good a good thing that they've had with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll say Wendy, be, Wendy being that mother-like figure to not just John and Michael at the start of the film, but also to the Lost Boys at this point. And even Smee ends up getting emotional over this. Now, now I don't, I don't know if that's sort of like a, a hint towards the fact that he didn't know his mother himself or something different entirely, but um, I will say this: if that were me, yeah, I'd be a little bit, emo I'd be a little bit emotional as well if I was, if I was in their position. But then we have the issue of um, Wendy, John, and Michael um, saying that they need to head back home to London. And Peter's just like, "Want? Fine, leave. But once once you grow up, you can never come back." Yeah, that's a little. What's what I'm looking for? That's. Not the sort of thing you want to be. Not the sort of thing you want to be hearing from somebody that you've made stories about for, for a like while. An ultimatum, isn't it? Essentially, yes. That that's 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 the, that's that's something that's something along the lines I was looking for. The, the ultimatum. You can you can either stay here or you can go home. But if you go home, just don't come back. But um, I said once. But of course, uh, while all this is happening, Hook has managed to capture Tinkerbell, and Tinkerbell actually leads Hook and Smee to the Lost Boys' hideout, and. I act, and uh, th these are the these are the lengths I went to in my notes when it came to going through this particular scene. Th th these are the these are the lengths that I went to. Um, with them, um, with the with the bomb that's due to detonate at six o'clock. Time inaccuracies in the film compared to the actual runtime of the film. Um, wait, I was like, I was like, bear with me, folks. Um, the time inaccuracies. Hook says thirteen seconds until the until the bomb detonates. When in when in actual fact, according to the runtime, anyway, there was eleven seconds. Then he says twelve seconds when there's actually meant to be nine seconds left on the clock. And it hits the point where the bomb does detonate 14 seconds after it was supposed to, based on the actual runtime of the film. Now I know this was all, I know the way it was done was to like do like some sort of like building the tension, but you've, what Disney failed to realize is that they've got people like me that uh, do like to, um, go to these sort of lengths to be able to like point out uh, inaccuracies which i've which i've done on many an occasion with my everything wrong with tom and jerry series uh which by the way folks latest episode is up on my channel right now which you can see top right alongside the playlist for that um series um but with the way the way um, the way the um tom and jerry videos that i'm editing now are concerned uh i'm only going to be able to get um I'm only going to be able to guarantee at least one of those videos a month, possibly two, depending on how quickly I can get the videos edited together. Because um, because uh, because nitpicking, nitpicking uh, Tom and Jerry episodes, ruining people's childhoods in the process, it's a bit of a lengthy process. But um, but the bomb detonates after Tinkerbell tries to warn Peter Pan about, about the whole bomb. Um, Tink tries to escape 
and uh, the bomb detonates and the crew of the ship alongside the Lost Boys and the Darling Kids, they think Peter Pan's dead. But next, next shot, lo and behold, he's still alive. Now, I would say, now one thing I will say regarding that is with how close the explosion was to both Tinkerbell and Peter Pan, yeah, realistically they should both be dead, but uh, yeah. The last thing we want is a, last thing we want to repeat of what happened with uh, Bambi's mum uh, in uh, Bambi. Last thing we want to repeat of that. Uh, yeah, let's just say last thing we want to do is traumatize more kids. But, exactly. That's the amazing thing about animation is that yeah. bad things don't actually have to be yeah. bad. Yeah. But I, but, but, but thanks, thankfully, thankfully, Tinkerbell and um, thankfully, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan are okay. Um, and then it's it, and then the next song, the next song that um, actually, I'll, actually, music. There we go. Do, 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 do. Uh, I found the uh, do, 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 you know, don't mind. Uh, the elegant Captain Hook. That's um, that. Um, just, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure that's the song that's used uh, at that point. But um, I say the elegant Captain Hook, uh, Hook's crew singing about the fact that they managed to get the lost, capture the lost boys and the darling kids. They either they either join Hook's crew. Or they walk the plank. Standard pirate stuff. Join us or you walk the plank, mateys. That sounded more like Mr. Krabs than anything else. Yeah, it did. You're doing a SpongeBob episode or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, no, so, um, so, I mean, I mean, I didn't watch I didn't watch that many SpongeBob episodes growing up, but when it was on, when it was on, I did I did watch. But uh, was it was the, the general consensus, uh, as far as SpongeBob is concerned, is that the best episode of SpongeBob is one called Band Geeks, where uh, Squidward's trying to get everyone in Bikini Bottom to form this uh, this band to perform at the Bubble Bowl, which is basically their basically their version of the Super Bowl, folks, and uh, and it all and it all climaxes with. With a song called "The Sweet Victory," which I say again, can't play it because copyright issues. But um, I say it's, I say it, it's one of those rare examples of showing a moment of triumph for, um, I say, especially especially for somebody like Squidward. But um, but for, like I say, general consensus. Um, Band Geeks is without a doubt the best episode of, especially especially the early seasons of um, SpongeBob. So that's out the way. Um, where else are we? Uh, playing. Ah, oh, yeah, that's what we're after. Um, Wendy is the first to uh, walk the plank. You hear you hear the falling sound effect, but no splash, and everyone's questioning. Uh, did she hit the water? Why is there no splash? What they don't realize is the fact that Peter managed to catch Wendy on the way down, and then it all climaxes with the battle on the ship between um, the main battle, of course, between Hook and Peter. But the side battle, which is sort of like sort of like a sort of like a, a staple, it would be a staple, especially during the Renaissance era uh, of, um, of films. Don't guys, don't worry. I will get to the Renaissance films eventually. I still have a few more films to get through beforehand. I'm trying to get through these in chronological order. But um, you've got a lot on your plate, Fraser. You're uh, doing a lot. Yeah, but um. But I mean, at the end of the day, given, I mean, given the fact that we've 
we're going to be back in lock. We're still going to be in lockdown for another few weeks at least. Um, I might, I might as well keep, I might as well keep churning these ep, I might as well get churning, I might as well keep churning these episodes out. But yeah, um, I say it's, I say it's, it's a great, it's a great climactic battle. The, I mean, I mean, Michael somehow manages to get one of the uh, the cannonballs into his teddy bear, wax it on one of the pirates' heads, and somehow takes a chunk out of the sword with his teeth. I mean, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, that, that's, that's classic. That's classic Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry-esque slapstick right there. Just whack on the head, wide eyes, and fall to the ground and clunk. Or in Wile E. Coyote's case, the satisfying poof when he hits <laughs> the ground. <laughs> oh, dear. It's, um, but the climax of the battle... The, the climax of this whole scene, Peter fighting Hook. Peter even elects to fight with one hand tied behind his back, not being not allowed to fly as well. But he might, but the genius of his thinking, he manages to use like the ropes from the he manages to use his surroundings to his advantage and somehow manages to get Hook to um, be somewhat swallowed by the crocodile, um, manages, to, manages to get the clock out of the crocodile. Goodness knows how the digestive system worked in, in, in this crocodile's case. But, not, but of course, we all know that, we all know that, like I've mentioned earlier, we all, know, we all know he managed to swallow a clock, but the sound design in, the sound design in there at that point where, where Hook runs to the end of the crocodile and then runs all the way back out of his mouth, carrying the clock with him. Did the crocodile swallow a piano at the same time? Uh, I'll say, I'll say that, that's, just me, that's just me being a little bit... That's just me being uh, Tom and Jerry nitpicky. But, uh, <laughs> but um, the crew escapes. The crew escapes and... It's 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 quite hilarious this this part here um, that you've got Hook somehow skimming across the water as if you're skimming a pebble across the water. I mean, how? But but at the end of the day, Captain Hook's defeated and. The, and his ship ends up being not only painted gold, effectively, but also uh, just doused in pixie dust. And the ship flies into the sky to take the darling kids home. And... Peter becomes the captain of the ship and the Lost Boys do have the offer of going to London to be adopted but decide to stay with Peter in Neverland. And, and the film ends with George and Mary initially finding uh, the beds empty but then Wendy comes in and, te and tells them, there's ages, there's ages. Uh, well, Wendy's actually sleeping on the nursery's open window. And, and then once she wakes up, she's, she's very excited to tell George and Mary about her adventures in Neverland with John and Michael. And amazingly, George recognizes the pirate ship shape in the clouds, recognizing it as the ship from his own childhood, which 
does that f- further add fuel to the whole fan theory of him being Hook in Wendy's stories? Yeah. But, but, um, but George has softened at this point about um, Wendy staying in the nursery. And, and then, of course, another staple at the end of, the, another staple at the end of uh, films of that era, especially uh, the choir, the choir singing uh, You Can Fly at the end. And there we go. That is the end of uh, Peter Pan. So, uh, the f- so there we go. So that's us. Uh, we've um, we've gone through we've gone through the the whole story of um, Peter Pan. I've gone through my notes. So so um, what would you, what would you say was the uh, the best thing you learned about um, the film doing this episode today? Oh, that's a hard one to point out. Um, I think definitely the the thing that stood out to me most, like watching the film, it was the start of the disclaimer. I think that was really interesting. That the yeah. like how it wasn't good then, it wasn't good now. Mm-hmm. Uh, isn't good now the way that they portray the American Indians yeah. uh, or Native Americans and then also I think um, I really just the I just really like watching it all over again um, and your insights of all the, the little things that I never noticed before it's all very good yeah that's it and I think, of course, so of course, that that's the that's the great thing with that's the great thing with um, that's the great thing about uh, doing this series that um, the, the things that the things that we the things that we all learn about about these about, about these films when when recovering I say I say especially especially me learning stuff about these um, about these films and and I, and I call and I call myself a big Disney fan and um, I say I say it's, it's always interesting to hear uh, what. Um, what 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 my guests learn from these um, from these films as well. But uh, yeah, that's so. Uh, scores now. Um, see, see the scores. So uh, the scores. Um, oh, you okay there? Me. Right. I say, I say, I, 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 just heard, I just heard a, I just heard a, a, just heard a, a, a loud, I just, I just heard what sounded like a loud squeak on your end. I think it's me opening my water bottle. Ah. Ah, right. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not just me then. Yeah. So, right. So, uh, now the scores. Uh, um. Was like uh, the story I get, and of course, and of course, these are all out of these are all out of ten, folks. Um, I say the scores, the story I gave an eight out of ten, um, m- mainly because I was like, I see, I mean, don't get me wrong, I say it's a gr- it's a great story, but there were some there were some elements in there that I felt were, um, I said there were a, there were a lot of. Th- there are a few things in in each of the categories that I cover here. So the five categories I've got: uh, story, characters, visuals, soundtrack, and of course, finishing off with the legacy. Uh, the legacy of the film has, but um, let's say, let's say, um, let's say the, the points. Let's say, um, let's say the scoring. It's it's all da- it's all down to the whole uh, controversy with how the um, Native Americans were portrayed. The 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 racial implications, if you will. Um, so, so at the end of the day, um, I, c- I couldn't really give higher than an eight on 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 any of the categories. I say the story I gave an eight. Um, I say the characters again, as I've mentioned, the whole um, Native Americans uh, fiasco that was an eight as well. Um, I say the visuals. 
the vision is I couldn't really, I couldn't really go higher than an eight either. Uh, but, but I mean, don't get me wrong. It, don't get me wrong. I say Neverland itself looks absolutely fantastic, but it was, I, said, I, said, I can't, I can't really pinpoint. I said, I could, at the end of the day, I couldn't really see myself pinpointing uh, anything that I haven't already covered to like give it a, a higher score. Cause, cause, cause like I say, uh, underage tattoos on, on kids, a uh, bit, uncom- bit uncomfortable for, for some people. Um, let's see the soundtrack. That was a seven for me. Uh, now the reason, the reason it was a seven, I mean, I mean, yes, the songs are iconic, but, um, but the thing is, uh, as far as the, as far as the soundtrack is concerned, I take, I take not just the songs into account, but also the score into account as well. And I feel that I think if there was if there was a if there was a balance between the score and the songs, I could have I could have bumped the score up a little bit. But 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 of course, um, what stops it what stops it from getting any higher is of course what made the Red Man Red. Uh, so yeah. I'll say yeah, seven for the soundtrack. Uh, and the last and the last topic is, of course, the legacy. What impact the film has had since its release? Well, there have been a lot of there's been a lot to um to put in here as far as the legacy of the film is concerned. Um the Disney Fairies series um was not because how that played out was there was there was a series of children's books which featured Tinkerbell and her friends and there was also a series of Tinkerbell films part of the whole Disney fairies um series um and now I am aware that those sort of films especially the Tinkerbell films are not really the sort of films that are aimed towards my sort of demographic but some like my like young um young girls that's not like the main demographic those films would be aiming for but rest assured don't worry i will cover those as part of the uh, direct to vid direct to home media uh run of uh, uh disney films but of co- but of course i've got these animated films to do and i've also got the um i've also got the pixar films to do as well before I go into like any other of the um any of the other Disney films. Um so um theme parks wise there there was um there was a there was a, a ride called Peter Pan's Flight which is found at Disneyland Paris Walt Disney World um Oh, look, I said, well, there's a Disneyland in California and there's a Disneyland in Paris. I've not been to Disneyland or Disney World yet, folks, but I am determined to take that off my bucket list, however long it takes. Uh, then you've got Walt Disney World itself in Florida, Tokyo Disneyland, Disneyland Paris, I've already mentioned, and Shang- and the Shanghai Disneyland Park. And you, and you also get, a, and there's also appearances from Peter Pan, Wendy, Hook, and Smee at various Disney parades. And you can, and the, and they also, and you're also able to. Um, you also get greetings from them throughout throughout the theme parks as well. And inter- and uh, interestingly, they, uh, Peter, Wendy, Hook, and Smee, and the pirates also featured in a scene in Disneyland's original version of of uh, of a nighttime show called Fantasmic between 1992 and 2016. There's also been some, there's also been uh, some ice shows as well that feature Peter Pan, most prominently Disney on Ice. That I would, that I would definitely love to go and see as well. Um, in the world of games, meanwhile, oh boy. Um, this is what I say, I've mentioned it on numerous occasions. I even mentioned it in Alice in Wonderland last time out that um, Peter Pan featured, well, the world of Neverland featured as a playable world in the Kingdom Hearts series, specifically Kingdom Hearts 1, Kingdom Hearts 
two, um, Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories, 358 over two days, and Birth by Sleep. And Peter Pan also appears as a summon in Kingdom Hearts 2. And those who know me well know how much I love the Kingdom Hearts games now that, I'm, that, I'm able to, that I've been able to play them. Um, there was also a board game in 1953 as well. Um, Walt Disney's Peter Pan, A Game of Adventure, which, um, which at the time, it was, um, it, was one of the, um, it was one of the many toys that, um, that took full advantage of the popularity of Disney's post-World War II films. Let's say Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, um, among others. It's, and, um, and of course, next, next film, which I'll be covering in, my, in the next episode, Lady and the Tramp. So that's the next episode, folks. Um, there was also a musical, interestingly. Um, uh, Peter Pan Jr., a one-hour children's musical based on the Peter Pan movie with some updated material. And, and, after, and after several pilot, pilot productions, school and children's theatres Schools and children's theatres were able to use this um, from 2013 onwards. On the movie front, uh, I've already mentioned the. Um, on the movie front, I've already mentioned the uh, live action remake. I say again, no idea what what the release date is going to be for that. But as far as sequels are concerned, um, I've mentioned I've mentioned the Tinkerbell films as well. Um, Six, there was uh, six feature length films and two shorts in, in that Tinkerbell film series, but a direct sequel to Peter Pan was released in 2002, uh, Peter Pan Return to Neverland, which focuses on Wendy's daughter, Jane. So, um, so it's got, I think, overall, the film has a great legacy, but it's the whole racial implications that that stop it from going any higher than an eight. So so four eights and a seven. Over I say overall still not still not a bad score. But um now that that's out now that we've uh, got the scores in um just we'll just run it through the just run it through the uh, just run it through just run it through uh, make the calculations Divide by 50 times it by 100. And we have a total score of 78%. 78% for Peter Pan, which puts it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It oh, just, just and no more, folks. It just squeezes into the top 10. Wow. Yeah. Is it gonna is it still gonna be there come my uh, top ten um come the top ten Disney films uh list to mark one year of Disney Plus and King of Isolation? Well we'll need to stay tuned to find out because like I say, the next episode I'll be cover in the next episode I'm gonna be covering Peter uh I've already covered Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp. Now now the thing is if I was able to cover this a bit earlier. I would have been able to get Lady in the Tramp out in time for Valentine's Day. But hey, but hey, ho, those are the cards I've been dealt. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, that covers everything as far as Peter Pan is concerned. 78% just squeezes into the top 10, sandwiched in between the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad and fun and fancy free. So that being said, that brings us to the end of um, um, this trip into the uh, Kingdom of Isolation. Beth, thanks very much for uh, joining me. I've been really excited to have you on board. And I will say this, that it was definitely worth the wait. Thanks for having me, Fraser. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, rest of the um, um
Um, so once I finish recording, I'll um, I'll um, I'll try I'll try and get something in place for uh, for you and Alistair to be in uh, in the same episode uh, with me. But say but say well, uh, I'll I'll go through that once we once we um, finish recording. But in the meantime, if you guys enjoyed what you saw, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be dream chasers like both of us, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bell to join the dream chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that I do on this channel. The end cards are on the way, folks. Don't worry about that. Uh, next episode is going to be Lady and the Tramp. And I'm going to have my good friend Michael from Movies and Milk. Uh, yeah, Movies as in M-O-O-V-I-E-S. Oh. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to having Michael back on board uh, to cover Lady and the Tramp. So uh, that being said, I uh, hope you guys... Um, I hope you guys um, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, last thing, last thing though. Um, between the two of us, would we recommend this film? I would. Yeah, ab absolutely. I was like, I think like, mainly for mainly for the I think one of the main reasons for recommending this film absolutely is uh, mainly because of um, the work that J M Barry did with Great Ormond Street Hospital. And this film was dedicated to that hospital, which is in itself absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic. And of course, you've mentioned yourself that the hotel you work with, they raised money for the Great Ormond Street Hospital as well. So that, so that being said, um, we hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, join, us, um, join me next time as I cover Lady in the Tramp. But in the meantime, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation. <laughs>